praise God. Again, I really thank God for this uh, privilege that we can study again God's Word. Uh, a bit of good news, I met my uh, oncologist uh, last uh, Thursday, and uh, we have reached the, uh, what did he say? The uh, threshold. And so my PSA count is down to 0 0.02. Wow. Praise God. And so starting next month, uh, my injection will be, instead of once a month, it will now be once every six months. And so, uh, and again, I really just uh, thank the Lord for the way He's been uh, sustaining me. Despite the hectic schedule, I had a full uh, whole day seminar yesterday. I preached this morning at the church celebrating its 34th church anniversary and then uh, this afternoon. And so we need to ask that question, what time is it? <laughs> All right, there are at least two ways you can answer that question. Of course, one of the ways is uh, you can look down at your watch and tell me what time it is. It's 327 my watch. But the other way of answering that question is looking around and tell me what time it is. With everything that's happening in the Middle East, you can say, Pastor Roy, it's a time of uncertainty. Or you can even say, Pastor Roy, it's a time of crisis. And you will be right. We will agree with you. And so people are very concerned during this time. They're asking that question, what in the world is going to happen? If this war is going to escalate, if other uh, Middle East countries will be involved, if Russia will be involved, if Iran will directly be involved with Hezbollah in the north and then Hamas in the south and uh, uh, on the uh, southeast, the uh, Houthis will be involved. Wow, this will be a, a bigger mess. And so people would like to know, what in the world is going to happen? Now, there are at least three ways you can answer that question. One way is what is called the superstitious method. And uh, here in the superstitious method, you know, we deal with tarot cards. We deal with, uh, um, you know, crystal balls. And one of the oldest professions is uh, predicting the future. But uh, according to the survey, it's only just 5% accurate, or to put it negatively, it's 95% wrong. And yet, 6 out of 10 men and 7 out of 10, 7 out of 10 women read their horoscopes every day. So do you know your zodiac sign? Bad for you. <laughs> and so again, it's 95% wrong. The other way of predicting the future is what is called the uh, scientific method. And you know, there are computer programs that they're using today to uh, project the things that can happen. This is called futurology. Deduction from observation is a basic tool of modern science. And according to one computer program, Calculating and putting into account the population growth, the uh, food and energy resources, the env environmental decay, that the likely date of the end of the world will be 2040. 2040. We're already 2023. Next year is 2024. So how many more years left? How many more years left? Yeah, too bad. And you're still single, huh? All right. And so you need to... Uh, do something about that, if that is true. And so friends, the average accuracy of published results has so far been 25% accuracy, or to put it negatively, it's 75% wrong. But now the third and perhaps the most neglected method of understanding the future is the scriptural method. The scriptural method. Declaration about future events is a major feature in the Bible. Do you know that out of the 31,124 verses, 8,352 contain a prediction? And this covers about 737 separate subjects. But what is so interesting is out of the 737 separate subjects, 594 subjects have already come true. 
that's more than 80% already that the Bible predicted that has happened already. More than 80%. The more than 18% that has not happened yet has to do with the end of the world, which obviously has not happened yet. But that gives us ample grounds for confidence that the rest will also be fulfilled. And so it's amazing that there are people today who would rather consult satanic counterfeit or computer logic rather than looking to the Bible and finding the answer to that question, what in the world is going to happen? And if there's one event that, uh, that stands above them all in all the prophecies of the Bible, it has to do with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The importance of his return is established by the frequency, the intensity of the biblical references to this climactic event. Someone said that biblical revelation can be summarized by three statements. He is coming, he has come, and he is coming again. But then of all these revelations about the future, they're not given just to satisfy our curiosity. The reason why God informs us what will happen tomorrow is so that we will know how we ought to live today. And it's sad that there are Christians today who are living their lives as if Jesus Christ is not coming again. They're living compromised lives. They're living the life of complacency. And you know, I always uh, love it when I hear that there will be people who will be staying with us. They'll be coming because that means we'll be able to clean the house again. And so uh, I'm looking forward to somebody coming and staying with us or having fellowship there because we know we'll be able to clean up the house again. But this afternoon, we're going to look at this passage that tells us clearly how we ought to live knowing that the night is almost over and the day is almost here. And so we are answering that question, what time is it? And reading Romans 13, 11 to 14. Let's all stand and let's uh, read these uh, four verses all together now, starting with verse 11. Ready, read. The hour has come for you to wake up. <clears throat> the night is nearly over. So let us put aside the deeds. Let us behave decently as in daytime. Not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we realize that we are in the end times. There's a lot of things that are happening in the world today and we're really not sure how things will uh, turn out, especially what will happen in the Middle East. But we are so thankful, Lord, that in the Bible we, we already know who's going to win. We already know the ending story. And so there is hope. There's something to look forward to. Even though we have to suffer a little bit now, and yet we know that we'll, there will be rejoicing at the end of the day. And so, Lord, we just pray right now that even through this passage, that you would guide us, that this message will infiltrate our hearts, so that not only will it inform us, but there will be a clear transformation in the way we live our lives today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. You take your seats. I shall return. These are words made popular by General Douglas MacArthur, but we all know that he wasn't the first one to give us these reassuring words. Almost 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ gave his disciples the same promise before he left them and went to heaven. 
I shall return. And the theme of this portion of scripture is that in view of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, how then should you and I live? You'll notice that the, in the opening words of verse 11, the Apostle Paul said, And do this understanding the present time. Do this. Do what? Well, if you look at the background to this, the previous chapter, for example, you'll know that in Romans chapter 12, he already talked about how you and I can become good Christians, how you can use your gifts, how you can relate with, uh, with uh, brothers and sisters, and how you can relate with your non-Christian neighbors. It's all there in chapter 12. But in chapter 13, 1 to 10, he talked about how you and I can become good citizens where you need to pay taxes, obey the government. But now here, in chapter 13, verse 11, he's going to explain to us one good motivation for us to be obeying all of this, and it's because of the present time. If only we understand where we are right now in God's prophetic plan, friends, there's no greater incentive to be doing the duties of a Christian than to have the lively expectation of the Lord's return. And so we need to have an understanding of the present time if we are to continue pursuing a Christian conduct. So do you know what time it is? Do we really understand what the Bible has to say about the time? And so the whole thrust of this passage that we have just read is that we need to be aware of the time in which we live. Brothers and sisters, we are living in alarming times. We need to be aware that this is the 11th hour when it comes to Bible prophecy. So let's continue reading verse 11. He said there, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And so what does Paul say about the time? He says, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Now, if you're just a new Christian, you might be wondering, why did Paul say our salvation is nearer now? I thought when I received the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm already saved. But it seems here, he's implying that it's still on its way. What does it mean? Well, if you look at the scriptures and look at the whole subject of salvation, you'll find out that salvation is found in three tenses. It's found in the past tense, it's found in the present tense, and it's found in the future tense. You would be perfectly correct, biblically, to say, I have been saved, I am being saved, I am going to be saved. You see here, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the past tense of salvation, which is called justification. Let's read this together. For it is by grace. Ready, read. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so, friends, you can be accurate in saying, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. That is salvation in relation to past time. The moment you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, your sin penalty, which Jesus Christ paid on the cross. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? It is finished. The actual word there, it's been fully paid. There's nothing more that you need to add. You don't have to crucify yourself. It's been fully paid. That is what we call justification. And then the Bible talks about our salvation in relation to present time. And so here in present tense, it's called sanctification. Let's read 1 Corinthians 1.18. Ready, read. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So you'd be perfectly correct in saying, I am being saved from the power of sin. You see, that is our just our sanctification. Day by day, we're becoming more of what we ought to be and less of what we are. You see, we're still struggling with sin right now. 
The penalty has been dealt with, but the power is still there. The flesh is still working. We're still tempted by the world. Satan is still tempting us. There's still some addictions that we need to get over with. Some people are addicted to nicotine. Others are, nic are addicted to alcohol. Others are addicted to Facebook or TikTok. And you know it's already 3 o'clock in the morning and you're still watching YouTube. And you have to go to work the following day at 7 o'clock. You know that you need to overcome this. It's still in control. And day by day, we are becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we should be able to say, I am being saved from the power of sin. But then the Bible also makes it very clear that there is the future tense of salvation. And this is what we call glorification. Let's read Romans 5, 9. Ready, read. By his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? You see, it's in the future tense. And that's what he's saying here in Romans 13 verse 11. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. It's coming. That's what we call glorification. That's when we talk about heaven. That's when we talk about a brand new body. You see, man is made of spirit, soul, and body. The moment you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, your spirit is now united to God. You are now saved. But your soul, your mind, your heart, and your will, it's still being changed. The power of sin is still struggling with the spirit that is within you. But your body will someday be changed. It will become like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It can go through walls, not limited by time and space. I'm just excited. To have a brand new body. I know I'll have more hair. That's for sure. I'm still handsome. It, it my glorified body. It will not change. But friends. Again. That is the future tense of salvation. When we are saved from the very practice of sin. And so you can say. I will be saved from the practice of sin. So three P's. You are saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved from the power of sin. And you will be saved from the very practice of sin. The very presence of sin. There's no more flesh that you have to struggle with. You are now given a glorified body. And so the first thing the Apostle Paul is telling us here. And by the way, I got a quote here. When... Finally, General Douglas MacArthur made good with his promise, I shall return. He reached Leyte, and there he was able to, over the radio broadcast, he said, People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, we have come dedicated and committed to the task of destroying every vestige of enemy control over your daily lives. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus Christ comes again, He will come to destroy every vestige of enemy control over our daily lives. That is our glorification. Finally, freed from the very presence, the very practice of sin. Now, that's a good place to say amen. amen. And so because our salvation is almost here, brothers and sisters, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. And so what Paul is telling us here, answering that question what time it is, number one, friends, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Come on, turn to the one beside you, say, wake up. Just turn. Wake up. If the one sitting beside you is sleeping, then you just disturb him. But I always tell people, if somebody is sleeping during my sermon, just let them be. Do not disturb them. Because we also believe that God speaks through dreams. And so maybe God has a special sermon for this person. But friends, it's time to wake up. If we only know the time, what time it is, the present time, 
And this 11th verse is the alarm clock of the soul. It's time to be alert, my friends. Why? Because verse 12 continues by saying, The night is nearly over and the day is almost here. What does that mean? The night is nearly over. That means that the dark and distressful night of sin and evil is almost over. And the bright day of Christ's return is about to break through that darkness. Now, I don't know when Jesus Christ is going to come again, but the Bible makes it very clear, assures us that He's coming back. In fact, if you compare the number of prophecies with regards to the first coming and the number of prophecies with regards to the second coming, the ratio is 1 is to 8. That means, friends, if you are sure He came here the first time, you can be 8 times more sure that He's coming the second time. And so with that question, what in the world is going to happen? There are certain things the Bible is telling us that we need to watch for. What events should we particularly notice as we read the newspaper, as we go through YouTube, as we watch the news? Well, one thing, friends, is that the new world order, one thing that's going to develop is there going to be a one world government. The stage is being set right now for that one world government. The past two years of lockdown just showed us that the United Nations or the World Health Organization can overpower the authorities within a nation. They can lock down nations. But that one world government, that's just a testing. But there's also going to be a one world religion. And then there's going to be a one world currency. And so that paper money that you now have will be useless one day. There's going to be a one world currency and somebody, this somebody whose name can be given as 666. If you calculate his name, it becomes 666. He will be in control of all these three. The one world government, the one world religion, and the one world currency. So we're expecting that. When you read the news, you can begin to imagine, oh, this is a preparation for this. But then also in the Bible, it's clear that Israel, that tiny nation there in the middle, will be attacked by all these nations mentioned in the Gog and Megog War, mentioned in the Battle of Armageddon. Those are two separate wars. But there's going to be a coalition that will attack Israel. And that's why we're watching very closely what's happening in the Middle East right now. Because right now it's just between Hamas and Israel. Now we know that Iran is the one providing all the support to Hamas. And we know that Hezbollah now is trying to uh, uh, do some damage from the north. But it's not yet a coalition of all these other nations that are mentioned in uh, the Gog and Megog War. We know that Russia will be involved. We know that Turkey will be involved. We know that Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan, Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, they will be involved one day. So maybe this is just a dry run. But that's what we're watching. And then last Sunday we showed you the seven signs of the second coming. There will be deceivers in the world. There will be disasters in the planet. There will be disasters in the, deserters in the church. There will be a dictator in the Middle East. There will be darkness in the sky. Diaspora in the promised land. And then our present condition will be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And you know what was happening in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. There was a kind of sex that was happening that was not part of God's design. Where male and male are having sex, female and female are having sex. This is not part of God's design. And so friends, what time is it? The Apostle Paul is telling us here, it is time to wake up. There's no time for Christians to be spiritually asleep. And you know, I fear sometimes that one of the dangers of the modern church, we make it so comfortable, it's temperature controlled, it's air conditioned, it's cushioned, the chairs, we make it so comfortable that people go to sleep. You come to church to sleep. But how do you know if a church is a sleeping church? 
you'll know it by the number of people who attend the prayer meeting. Why? Because a church that is alive is a praying church. You'll know it by the number of vacant chairs on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon in our case. Why? Because a church that is alive is a witnessing church. You'll know it by the number of people who are involved in the ministry. Why? Because a church that is alive is a serving church. You'll know it by the amount of money in the offering. Why? Because a church that is alive is a giving church. It's an investment. Whenever you give, you believe in that project, you give because it's an investment. You know that there will be returns. Your money is well invested. It's a seed that will grow. And that's why we support the work of the church. And I tell you, friends, we need to be awake. You know, sometimes people, when they come to the church, they have a signboard here, do not disturb. We need to be on fire for Jesus Christ now. We need to be working for Jesus now. Why? Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Brothers and sisters, if you look at verse 12, it gives us a second action. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. What time is it? Secondly, it's time to clean up. It's time to clean up. Come on, say to the one beside you, clean up. Clean up. If you came here this afternoon without using a deodorant, then you mean that more than you've intended to mean it. It's time to clean up. And here the Apostle Paul, not an exhaustive list, but gave us a triplets. All right? It's by twos. But here he said, let us behave decently as in daytime. And then he said, not in orgies and drunkenness. Not in orgies and drunkenness. Now, drunkenness is familiar to us, but orgies, what is that? Well, the word that was used here is very interesting. It's a picturesque word. It was originally used of gangs of drunken boys who would proceed at the streets at night and make a nuisance of themselves. You know, like after winning the soccer, their, their soccer team won, there'll be, or especially if it lost, there'll be rioting on the streets. And so that's the idea there of orgies. It's the wild parties and the rioting. That's the idea of orgies there. And it's connected with drunkenness. If you're still involved with some alcohol, look at the statistics in America. 42% of all traffic deaths, alcohol is a contributing factor. 49% of the crimes in America, alcohol is a contributing factor. And what are those crimes? Every 24 hours in America, 65 murders, 299 rapes, 388 aggravated assaults, 4,413 auto thefts, 8,164 burglaries. And 49% of those crimes, alcohol is a contributing factor. And so if you're a Christian, you have nothing to do with alcohol. Don't think of those verses that hey, Jesus Christ changed water into wine. And the Apostle Paul advised Timothy to drink some wine. It's good for his stomach. Well, friends, remember that the wine at the time is sub-alcoholic. Unlike the wine that we have today, the alcohol content is so high. So it's not, it doesn't equate. But then the second couplet here, orgies and drunkenness, and then sexual immorality and debauchery. Now we know sexual immorality. That's a problem that we're having today. Casual sex, one night stand. It's affecting not only our young people today when they go to university. I remember when my daughter Rejoice went to university, they got a backpack. Inside the backpack was a 
plastic full of condoms. It's, a, it's understood that they will have casual sex. It's understood. When we arrived here in Canada, Josiah was just 15 years old, still in high school, and then one day he came home and then said, Dad, I have three condoms here. Where did you get those condoms? Well, we had sex education and the teacher distributed all condoms to all the students. Why is just expected in our society today? Friends, the Bible is still clear. Sexual immorality is not God's will. You ought not to be pregnant when you're still single. You get pregnant after the wedding. That's still the biblical standard. Sexual immorality. But this is now being practiced in a very private sense. Like do you know that there are around 42 million pornographic websites? 42 million. We can have one website for each Canadian because we're only 40 million Canadians. And then number two, 11 is the average age that a child is first exposed to pornography. The age of 11. And then 94% of children will see pornography by the age of 14. And then number four, now this one is scary. Because of young Christian adults, 18 to 24 years old, 76% actively search for pornography. But the worst case here in this survey is that 68% of church-going men and more than 50% of pastors view pornography on a regular basis. Sexual immorality. It's creating havoc so much to our families, to our young people. Peter was so accurate. He hit the nail on the head with his words. He said, they commit adultery with their eyes and their lust is never satisfied. Friends, that is pornography. They commit adultery with their eyes. And their lust is never satisfied. And that's why if you're struggling with this and you somehow, you know, your mouse keeps going to pornographic websites, then make a screensaver on your computer and it says, as for me and my mouse, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> All right? Para makonsensya ka naman ng konti. As for me and my mouse, we will serve the Lord. But then there's that word debauchery. And again, that word is not so familiar to us. Debauchery means unbridled lust. Unbridled lust. And that's why it came to mean shamelessness. Shamelessness. Sa Tagalog, wala nang hiya. The things that ought to make you blush, you're even proud of it. You post it on Facebook. You have this, you have this skimpy dress. Two piece and you're right there. What ought to make you blush, you're proud of it. You're doing things that are not right. And, you're, and yet you're announcing it to the world. The Apostle Paul is saying here, these people, they do not know what time it is. They do not know what time it is. And then the last couplet here is dissension and jealousy. Dissension and jealousy. Dissension is a contentious rivalry, you know, because of personal ambition, personal desire for power, you desire to lift yourself up. No, you want to be elevated, you want to be renowned, you want to be recognized, you want to lift yourself up, and in order to do that, you put somebody down, and that is jealousy. Jealousy is the desire to put someone down. You know, it, I feel so sad that some people, they can only 
feel good about themselves, if they can make others feel bad. They can only smell good if they will bring out the bad smell of other people. Dissension and jealousy. And here the Apostle Paul is telling us, if you're a Christian, if you're a true believer in Christ, you have nothing to do with orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality, debauchery, dissension, and jealousy. In fact, I feel and I'm afraid that people are still involved in this after being a Christian for so many years. They will be embarrassed when Jesus Christ comes back and they might even miss the rapture. They won't be meeting Christ at all. They will miss heaven by eight inches. Just eight inches. Can you imagine that? Sayang, eight inches lang. Hindi ka pa nakaabot sa langit. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, that's eight inches right there. You're a professor that you're a Christian, but your life, doesn't agree with what you profess. Secretly, you're living a life of somebody who doesn't know that Jesus Christ is coming back. But the Bible is very clear, brothers and sisters. Let's all read this together. Ready, read. The person who has been born into God's family does not make a practice of sinning because now God's life is in him so he can keep on sinning for this new life has been born into him and controls him. He has been... He has been born again. He has been born again. And so you need to ask, we need to ask ourselves the question, is my lifestyle promoting the gospel or is it a hindrance to the furtherance of the gospel? Brothers and sisters, it's time to clean up. If Jesus Christ comes today, is there something you'll be ashamed of? Is there something you'll be ashamed of? Not if you're part of the fellowship of the unashamed. Let me read this for you. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I have stepped over the line. I won't look back, let up, slow down, or back away. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secured. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right. First, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. Lean on His presence, walk with patience, live by power and labor with power. Live by prayer and labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, spoken up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes... For his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner is clear. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. If Jesus comes today, will he recognize you? Friends, the words that we don't want to hear, if he comes today, are the words, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. The words we want to hear are the words, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is telling us, I'm ready to come 
are you ready for my coming? What time is it? Number one, it's time to wake up. Number two, it's time to clean up. And then number three, the last verse, verse 14. Let's read this together. Ready, read. Number three, what time is it? It's time to dress up. It's time to dress up. Come on, tell the one seated beside you, dress up. Dress up. If you happen to be wearing a skimpy dress there, then you mean that more than you've intended to mean it. Now look at verse 14 with me. This is a great piece of scripture. There's a positive here and there's a negative here. What you have here is a twofold decision that will enable you to be a dressed up Christian. First of all, you'll notice Paul said, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, that's not a literal, not clothing ourselves in a literal sense, like wearing a cloth that says, I'm a Christian or Jesus is Lord. Because the second half talks about, do not think about how to gratify. Therefore, the clothing yourself has to do with the thinking, your mindset. And that's why if I ask you, are you a dressed up Christian? It talks about your mindset. And it's a good advice that in the morning, when you wake up, before you grab your cell phone to check if there are many messages that came, before you talk to another person, you pray while you're still lying down on that bed. You pray this prayer. Come on, pray with me. Ready, pray. Oh God, I offer my eyes to you. I'll see what you want me to see. Dear God, I give my ears to you today to hear only what you want me to hear. I offer this mouth to you, Lord, to say only what you want me to say. Oh God, I give my hands to you today to do only what you want me to do. Lord, I give my feet to you today to walk only where you want me to walk. Oh God, I give you my desires and thoughts today. You and you alone, I want to please today. Lord, be glorified in my life today. Try to see how that will change your outlook in life. The moment you wake up. And then the pressures come. Somebody irritates you. You're driving and somebody cuts you. See how that will change your mindset. Because you're a dressed up Christian. Don't go out your home and not a dressed up Christian. And that's why I love this statement the Christian said she said I'm a missionary of Jesus Christ skillfully disguised as a caregiver I'm a missionary of Jesus Christ skillfully disguised as a caregiver and so every day we ought to come to Jesus and say Lord Jesus I know that you have a wonderful plan for my life today Lord Jesus just show me what you want me to do today. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Surrender your plan every day to the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the negative side here, it says, do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Do not think about how to gratify. You know what Paul is saying here? He's saying that we actually plan ahead to commit sin. You know where sin starts? It starts in the mind. And we actually plan ahead to commit sin. There was this guy, you know, having struggled with nicotine. And so he was driving and was, he's a Christian and he's saying to the Lord, if you really do not want me to buy cigarettes in the store, let there be no parking space at the store when I arrive. You don't have to pray that way because it's already God's will that you are not to be enslaved by nicotine. But that's what he did. And sure enough, he found a parking spot after circling five times the block. You know? 
Pag ikot niya, Lord, one more time. Pag wala talaga, you don't want me to buy. Five times, finally he found the spot. You see, we actually plan to sin. I mean, this little girl who wanted to join the youth camp, and the mother clearly gave her instructions, okay, you can go to the youth camp, but you don't go swimming. All right, little girl, don't go swimming. She nodded her head. A few days later, the mother went to visit her daughter. And sure enough, where is she? Where is she? Right there in the swimming pool. Swimming. And so she said, get out of that pool now. Get out of that pool. Didn't I tell you not to go swimming? Don't lie to me, little girl. You brought your swimsuit with you. And the little girl said, Mommy, I just brought my swimsuit just in case I'll be tempted. You see, we actually plan ahead to sin. And that's why Paul is saying here, do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Closing illustration, there was this guy who lived in an island. He would row his boat to go to the mainland to buy some stuff. And so one day he went to the mainland started rowing his boat and when he reached the mainland tied his boat to the wharf bought some stuff but then late in the afternoon he was already going back home already ate his dinner there were some guys there who were drinking come on one for the road drink first and so he got tempted started drinking one case of beer the second case of beer the third case of beer. <clears throat> Finally, it's already past midnight. And he said, I still have to go to my boat there. I still have to row my boat to go to my island. And so that's what he did. He started walking, you know, two, two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. He reached the warp and then started rowing his boat. And then he kept rowing and rowing and the sun was already up. And then he noticed that he hasn't gone anywhere. He kept rowing his boat. When he looked back, he found out that he was still tied to the wharf. <laughs> you see, sometimes we keep rowing our boats as Christians. You attend the care group. You attend the prayer meeting. You attend the services. You attend the, the Bible study. And yet, you're not growing as a Christian. Why? Because you're still tied to the wharf. There are certain ropes that you need to cut if you want to grow in the Christian life. You need to cut that rope of immorality. You need to cut that rope of laziness. You need to cut that rope of addiction to Facebook or whatever media there is. You need to cut that rope that is hindering you from growing in your Christian life. Because you'll just get tired of the Christian life. You'll get tired of the prayer meeting. You'll get tired of all these activities that we have here in church. Because you look at yourself and you're still the same. When the fact of the matter is, the problem is not the activities in the church. The problem is your personal activity when you're alone. Friends, what time is it? The Apostle Paul gave us three things. It is time to wake up. It is time to clean up. And it is time to dress up. Here's our prayer. Lord, I offer my life, my all to serve you now and always. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Our Father and our God, Lord, we've heard so many warnings already. In fact, we've heard this sermon before, maybe three years before. And yet, that's not the issue. The issue is, have we been changed? And so, Lord, our prayer this afternoon is that these warnings will sink deep in our hearts. So that when Christ appears, 
There's nothing to be ashamed of. And we will hear those words, well done, good and good servant. Enter the joy of your master. Oh, Father God, Lord, we pray. Thank you that you are the God of the second chance, the God of the many chances. Help us, Lord, to learn from the mistakes of others so that we won't commit the same mistake. Help us to be pure, to be protected from immorality, so that we can present our body to our future husband and to our future wife the best that we can be. Oh, Father God, Lord, help each one of us to live a life that is consistent with what we profess because we know what time it is. It's time to wake up. It's time to clean up. And it's time to dress up. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen and Amen.